Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Good to see you all tonight. Glad you are back for night number three of the missions conference. And let's stand and sing our mission song or our theme song again for the week, Around the Corner, Around the World. We surrender our lives, we prepare our hearts, and we launch out by faith. We invest, we expand, we spend, and are spent. We go out by faith, faith. and we find citizen communities without clear gospel presentation. We print tracts, plan services, and establish local churches. We train missionaries, we leave home, we go to the regions beyond. We learn languages, customs, and cultures so that others may learn Christ. We say goodbye to friends and family. We venture into the unknown. We take great risks. In short, we labor. Because true love always labors. We labor to establish local churches. We labor to train future leaders. We labor to develop faithful men who will teach others also. We labor because we know our, our labor, labor is, is not, not in vain. vain. All over the world, the labor of the local church, the labor of the local church, the labor of the local church is making a making difference. a difference. Well, praise the Lord. Welcome. We're excited again. Another another night to uh, be challenged. Another night to be stirred, excited to, to worship God together. I pray that you've come ready to uh, receive a blessing from God. I want to uh, just uh, do a little um, uh, announcements again. I'm going to ask our missionaries to stand once again. Uh, you may have not made it each night, so if you guys would stand. Let's show our appreciation for them once again. Amen. Amen. Our mission missionary families and uh, that are from our church, and we're excited to to highlight them this year in our conference. And that's been, a, like I said, a, a blessing so far. And I pray that you're again ready tonight. I want to say a few things. First of all, tomorrow night is going to be the last night, and you don't want to miss tomorrow night because a couple things are going to go on. Uh, number one, faith promise. We're going to be handing out the cards as we talked about last night. We are a thousand dollars. Uh, short every month from being able to uh, give um, a $50 raise to missionaries who aren't at $100. So we want to be able to do that, and we've asked you to be praying how God would um, lead you. And as we've talked about faith promise before, uh, maybe it's something that uh, as simple as a, a Starbucks visit or a, a McDonald's visit or uh, something like that, or maybe just pray, you know what, God, if you'll give me that money, uh, then I'll give it to missions. And I promise you this, if you'll be faithful to God, he'll be faithful every time to give that to you. Um, and so I, I want to encourage you to step out on faith and, and uh, help us meet that goal of, of giving those missionary raises uh, on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, another thing that we're going to do tomorrow night you don't want to miss is we're going to announce what we're doing as a church mission trip. And some of you know that a few years ago we took a group uh, or our church sent a group to um, Honduras to go with Brother Harold, and uh, it was more of a work trip. And uh, we took uh, men only, and there was there was people that were 
uh, hauling uh, block and, and mixing mortar and, and doing all kinds of stuff. And so this trip, again, next year, next July, is going to be more of a survey trip, and uh, it's going to be an opportunity uh, for you to go. Uh, and we're going to announce where that is and the cost and the details on all that tomorrow night. So you don't want to miss tomorrow night uh, for that reason as well. Uh, another thing is our engaged missions. we got those um, in each four corners of the room, uh, different regions. Again, last year we asked you to take a card and pray for those missionaries, engage those missionaries, email them, send cards to them, send Christmas gifts to them, really encourage the missionaries that we support. And, and I want to encourage you this year to be praying what, what region God would have you uh, do that for. Uh, do, do another region uh, that you did last year. Maybe some of you started off good the first month after missions conference. You said, man, I'm emailing these people every week. And then maybe as time went on, you forgot or you got busy and, and you didn't engage them. I want to encourage you again to, to re-engage, recommit uh, to engage in our missionaries because uh, many of us really doesn't, don't know what it's like to be on a foreign field with your family not around, friends aren't around, and um, we don't know how valuable it is uh, to receive words and letters of encouragement. Uh, but those, those do, and I will tell you, it's a, it's a huge encouragement to them. And uh, so I want to encourage you to do that. Lastly, we got the, the T-shirts in the back for our theme, uh, Life with Mission. And again, all the proceeds go to our missions uh, support. And so I want to encourage you to go back there, get a T-shirt or two, and uh, see that happen. We're excited that you're here, excited what God's going to do. And I just want to open up in, in a word of prayer uh, before I introduce our next presenter and uh, uh, just ask God to, to pour down his blessing on us. Father, we come before you. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we thank you for just the faithful group uh, that's here and that's been here every night. Lord, uh, we're all tired, God, that we, we live busy lives and probably we're, we're too busy. But, God, I pray that tonight we would just come empty before you. God, ready for you to, to pour into us what you want to. God, that we would be ready to not only receive but give to you what you deserve. Lord, our, ourselves, our worship, our attention to your word, God. And I just pray that you would pour out a blessing uh, that we can't even hardly receive. And Lord, I pray that you would be with the, the presentation. I pray that you would be with the speaker tonight. God, I pray that your spirit would have full control and that we would yield. God, we again thank you for this time, and we ask you to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Our presenter tonight is, uh, again, a, a very close friend and has been a friend of this church uh, from the beginning and uh, out supporters of their ministry for many, many years, and uh, they made us their home church last year, and we're excited to do that, excited uh, that they're a part of our family. They've always been a part of our family, but in an official capacity, a part of our family. And uh, they haven't been able to present uh, Brian Noble Children's Foundation in a while uh, for the simple fact that they're here and they're gone and they're here and they're gone. And he's preaching sometimes for us. Um, and he and I talked uh, several months back and we said, you know, let's, let's do that. Let's give an opportunity for uh, some of the new people who don't even know what they do uh, to hear what they do. And so... I want you guys to welcome Brother Harold Noble. Amen. I never had a desire to be a missionary. Never had that desire. Never had any, any inclination that God would ever do that. Went on the road in 1973 as an evangelist and enjoyed preaching revivals and loving them and leaving them. Do all the damage you can and leave the pasture to fix it when you're gone. And uh, we did a mission conference up in Oswego, Illinois for about 25 or 26 straight years. And a uh, pastor up there started a mission board out of his home church called Heartland Baptist Missions. And he calls me up on the phone and said, I want you to pray about uh, coming on board on our mission board. And uh, I've been around long enough to know that means we need some money. That's what it means. And so I, I did. I prayed about it for a couple of months and called him back and said, I don't know what I can do, but, you know, whatever I can do, I'll, I'll be glad to, you know, help you out. And as soon as I took the bait, he set the hook. He said, well, you really can't be on our board unless you take a mission trip. I don't want to do that. 
I found out if you got something you don't want to do, you can make enough excuses not to do it. Nod your head up and down like this. So I decided that if I took a mission trip, I'd have to cancel some meetings. We was just really booked one on top of each other. And I wouldn't have any income while I was on the mission field. And then I'd have extra expenses of going. And I just, I just couldn't do it because of these reasons. And I was pretty happy with that. Excuses. And I uh, went up there for the mission conference. I sit in his office, just me and him one afternoon. He said, hey, when are you going to take a mission trip? I said, preacher, I can't do that. I have to cancel two or three revivals. Wouldn't have any income. And it cost me extra money to do that. And he got up put one knee on the desk and started across to get me. I believe I could have took him. He's not that big, but still it startled me. He said, when are you going to do something for somebody that can't do anything for themselves and let God take care of you? Well, that kind of hurt. So I went out the bus where Jeannie was and I said, give me the credit card. Because she keeps the credit card. She said, well, you want it for us? I said, I'm going to book a trip. We're going to go on a mission trip. She said, what about canceling the meetings and not having any income and all the extra expense? And I said, woman, when are you going to do something, you know, for somebody else? And that's the way preachers are. They hear something real good, and they'll tell you and make you think it's their idea. So we went to Romania where we've been supporting a guy for several years, and God really got a hold of our hearts. He knows what it's going to take. I was preaching on a Sunday morning, I think it was leaving Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. We'd been there for a full week or mo longer, I don't really remember. And a woman came up and started talking to me, and I stood there for a minute and said, uh, if y'all want to talk to me, you've got to tell this guy here first, and then he'll tell me. So she started talking to him. He said, this woman wants you to come see her home. I said, well, you tell her I can't go today, but if she'll come by the motel tomorrow, I'll go see her home. I'd like to see a Romanian home. I want to see one because I'm never coming back to this country again. So I might as well see one right now. And she seemed to be pretty happy with that. She was at the motel in the lobby the next morning. We drove for an hour. I thought, man, where does she live? Out into a little old village. And it was an abandoned communist compound. She had a bunch of little kids. She picked out the garbage dumps and off the streets. It's freezing cold. And a death. Didn't have any food. Didn't have a bathroom. They had a hole in the ground. They didn't have a well. They could get water. Boy, God broke our hearts. Our son Brian passed away when he was nine years old. Got saved eight days before he died. Hasn't God been good to me? Yes, he has. I know where my son is. And there's a little boy there just about his age that had beautiful brown eyes just like my son had. I tried to make a connection with that guy. He just looked at me. I was the biggest, whitest thing he had ever seen. I come back with a broken heart for what I could do for those folk. And God has opened up the doors now to Honduras and the Philippines and Vietnam and India. And we'd really have invitations to Cambodia and Thailand and Taiwan and so many I, I can't even tell you all of them but I want you to see a couple of films tonight and then we're going to have some questions if you have any questions please don't hesitate to ask those so we can show that first video fellas
quite obsolete because we can't change them every time we make a trip. The orphanage has grown by leaps and bounds. If we show this next one, this is from the trip we just got back from about 10 days ago. Thanks, fellas. I appreciate it.
I'm sorry we had trouble with that. Uh, sometimes that's what happens. And you can pray for your missionaries as they don't always have the crack team of technicians that we have here. And uh, I mean that, the churches you go to, so it, it, can be a, it can be a mess. This is what you go through. And, uh, but we had a great trip. We had more than 700 saved this last trip to the Philippines. Uh, had preached in the jail, had 75 or more saved there. At the university, you saw we had over 500 saved there. And uh, while we were traveling to this church where we're building this building, uh, we had $1,000 to buy, like, it's, like the picture said, the concrete and to put in the bathroom and pour the floor. And uh, while I was on the road that Monday morning, I got a call from the States, which is Sunday evening, and the preacher said, the 15000 you need has been taken care of. So that building's totally taken care of. And we thank God for that. Amen. He's been so good to us. We had a great camp this year. We had 13 saved. We had 22 surrender to the ministry. We had 11 ready to go now. We're, spot, we're our foundation sponsoring eight young people through the three-year Bible college over there. It's very inexpensive, $375 a year for everything, room, board, everything. And uh, God's been so good to us. Brother Ryan quoted a verse the other night out of the book of James. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. The visits the fatherless and the widows in their affliction keep himself unspotted from the world. We've got two of those, the widows and the children, and now I'm working on me to keep myself unspotted from the world. That's the hardest thing. And then there's a verse that I love in Proverbs 19, 17. I looked it up today. He that hath pity upon the poor, he that hath pity upon the poor, listen to this, lendeth unto the Lord. That which he hath given, will he pay him again? So God's been very good to us. You say, preacher, I don't know what I can do. Stop back there and get one of our cards. Get one of Brother Jones's cards and, and get one of Christian and Shauna's cards. But pick up one of ours on the back. It'll tell you what can I do. And you can have a part in a teen camp or our Christmas outreach. We have more than 2,000 children want to buy Christmas for. Tells you how much a bag of rice costs. There's a way you can get involved in every one of these mission projects. For just a moment, do we have any questions? I don't want to take any more time. Yes, ma'am. 
Why do I travel a lot? Because Jesus told me to do it. Yes, ma'am. They do have houses. They're made out of bamboo that's been split and then kind of laced together with some leaves. Yes, sir. I can't hear it. Why is it? We want to build church houses so they can go to church. Anyone else? That's a good question. Anyone else? Oh, come on. A follow-up? Anyone? Yes, sir. That's right. Amen. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. And uh, the Lord has been very good to us. Any, anyone else with a question? Yes, ma'am. It is very hot all year long. I hung a shirt up in the closet and it sweated through the next morning. I wasn't even in it. Yes, ma'am. Not kind of cool and kind of hot. All hot. They have water. Yes, anyone else with a question? Yes, sir. I do not plant any crops. We just buy the rice from the rice mills. The 50-kilo uh, bag of rice, 110 pounds, costs about $45. In Vietnam, I can feed 800 meals out of a 110-pound bag. In the Philippines, with the children, about 200 meals. Kids eat a lot more than the widows eat. Anyone else? Yes, yes. I've been a missionary since 99 and evangelist since 73. That's old. Thank you for asking. Anyone else? Preacher, you come. Anyone else? That's it? Stop by the tables and see all these ministries. You have a part in all this. See where, you're, see where your investment is going. It's going to invest in the souls of men and women, boys and girls. God bless you, Pastor. Please stand and sing. Stand up for Jesus. to start doing some some jumping jacks in here tonight people retire have to wake up and uh, I think we were kind of mesmerized by the technological difficulties that we were facing I know I was looking at a black screen praise the Lord are you got you got to wake everybody up <laughs> I want to say we got some guests in here tonight and I want to encourage you guys to, to meet them at some point in time if you haven't already brother Clark has his lovely wife and some uh, friends from his church and some others that are visiting us tonight. So I want you guys to make them feel welcome. Amen. Let's pray and bless the offering. Father, we come before you. Thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you so much again for the opportunity uh, to be in your house, Lord. And God, what a blessing it is to see and to hear uh, what you're doing in and what you're doing through the noble family. God, is such a blessing. Lord, their faithfulness, their steadfastness through all the years. Lord, through thick and thin, through the, the good times, the bad times, Lord, is such a blessing, such an encouragement. Lord, I love hearing the, the questions from the little kids. I pray that they would see and they would hear this testimony and the work that you're doing, and their lives would be impacted and encouraged. And Lord, I pray that tonight all of us would be, Lord, that we would be encouraged that, Lord, you're still saving souls. 
whether it's here or whether it's across the world, Lord, you're, you're still working in people's lives. God, you're still building your church, and we're a part of that. And I pray that, again, you would prepare our hearts tonight as, as we get ready to hear your word preached. And I pray, Lord, that, Lord, as we have this opportunity to give, Lord, that we would not only give, but, Lord, that we would give with a cheerful heart. And, uh, Lord, that we would know that it's going for your work, Lord, for the kingdom, and, uh, Lord, to accomplish that which you have intended for it to accomplish. And, uh, God, I just pray that you bless it. And we ask and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We are again privileged to have Brother Clark come tonight and uh, bring God's Word. If you were here last night, hopefully you were challenged uh, and encouraged and stirred. And I uh, hope you're ready for that again tonight. Um, let's welcome him with a warm welcome. Amen. Brother Clark, won't you come? All right. I want you to do me a favor. Look to your right. Look at the person to your right. And I want you to say this good and loud. Say, neighbor. No, no, you're acting like Lutherans. Independent. Look to your right. Say, neighbor. Say, you're looking good. Now, how many of you lied when you said that? Come on, let me see your hands. All right, now look back to your left. Look back to your left. Good and loud. Say, neighbor. Say, you're not looking that good, but keep trying. Amen. 
Amen. Take your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And I want us to read verses 24, 25, and 26. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Almost 200 years ago, a professor by the name of Alexander Tyler wrote the following words about the fall of the Athenian Republic 2,000 years before that. So Professor Tyler, 200 years ago, uh, the uh, Athenian Republic was 2,000 years before that. So 2,200 years ago, he is referring to what was known as a democracy, and he said these words. He said, a democracy cannot exist. Did you hear that? A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most money from the public treasury with the result that a democracy always collapses over a loose physical policy, always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's great civilizations has been 200 years. These nations have progressed through the following sequence, from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from great courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, and from apathy to dependency, and from dependency back to bondage. You say, Clark, what does that have to do with your message? Absolutely nothing, but I wanted to read it for you tonight. When you come to Matthew chapter 16, I'm reminded that in the first four verses, the Pharisees and Sadducees come together, and the Bible said that when they come together, they are competing religious orders. They don't care about God. They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about the Word. They don't care that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. They don't care. As a matter of fact, when you read this, Jesus is now full-blown in his three, three-and-a-half-year earthly ministry. And he's declared himself to be the virgin-born Son of God. The Bible said now he's making his way. People are being saved. People are being changed. Multitudes are being fed. The blind are now seeing. The deaf are now hearing. The lame are walking. He is doing amazing things. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees, they now come to Jesus. And they join together. And the Bible said they begin to say, show unto us a sign. In other words, prove to us that you are who you claim to be. Prove to us that you really are the Messiah. Prove to us that you really are the Savior. And the Bible said that Jesus gave them an illustration, an illustration that they would have very easily related to. And that is that he said, listen, you say it's going to be fair weather. You say it's going to be good weather. He said, you get up in the morning and it looks clear and you say it's going to be great. You see it red and you say it's going to be foul weather today. He said, but listen, you get up every day looking for a sign. You get up every day looking to see if it's going to rain. Five to ten inches of rain for a year. They had to have stored that rain. They had to have kept it in an aqueduct system or in some sort of well. And yet when you read this passage, Jesus knows who they are. He knows what they are. And he knows what they're about. And the Bible said that Jesus then looked at them and said, ye hypocrites, do you understand? That the worst thing that can be said about you or the worst thing that can be said about me would be that we would be hypocrites. That we wouldn't uh, live what we say we believe. And Jesus looked at him and said, you hypocrite. That you cannot discern the sky and you cannot discern the signs of the time. And the Bible said that Jesus left them with this. He said, I leave you with the sign of the prophet Jonah. You remember Jonah. That Jonah was in the belly of the whale. And the Bible said he had been there three days. And after three days, he was expelled from that well. And he gave them a picture that one day, they're going to hang me on a cross. One day, they're going to walk by and wag their finger and mock and say, if you be the Son of God, bring yourself down. And they're going to laugh. And Peter and the disciples are going to run. But he said, I want to remind you, if you want to know who I am, he said, you get over there by that grave. 
Because he said, I'm coming out just like Jonah came out of the belly of the well in three days. They're going to take me down from that cross. They're going to put me in that tomb. And three days later, I am going to resurrect from that tomb. Mark this, Jesus said, when I come resurrected, he said, I'm going to have the keys. Do you understand when you have the keys, you can get in the house. When you have the keys, you can start the car. When you have the keys, you have access. And Jesus said, I have the ultimate key. And he said, so you get over there. I've got the keys to death. I've got the keys to hell. I've got the keys to the grave. If you can't believe me for the blind eyes seeing and the deaf ears hearing and the lame walking and the multitudes fed, he said, get over there by that tomb because I'm coming out with the keys. Then you read in the next few verses where the Bible said that Jesus looks at his disciples and the Bible said he gives them what is known as the doctrine. He says, you beware of the doctrine. Why does doctrine matter? Because listen, friend, what you believe is what you live. And what you live is what you believe. Don't live one way and say it doesn't matter. Don't say, well, I have a fundamental Baptist doctrine. I, I believe the Word of God is inerrant and infallible. And then go live like the world. No, what you live is what you believe. And what you believe is what you live. And when you read this passage, Jesus knew that these disciples were going to be in the midst of a crowd and he was going to send them out and he was going to give them the message and he was going to give them the gospel. And he said, I want you to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But, but he said these words, I said, I want you to beware of the leaven. You see, you knew they were men and you knew they were Baptists because they were thinking about food. That's how this works. And the Bible said here, then when he began to address them, he said, no, I want you to beware of what you teach. I want you to beware of what you preach. And then you come to verses 13 through 20. And Jesus stopped those disciples. And here's what he asked them. Listen to me. He said, whom do men, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that they are Elias. Some say that they are Jeremiah. Some say that they are one of the prophets. And Jesus said, no, I'm not asking what they think. I want to know what do you think? And the Bible said that Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You read that and you think, man, what, what a monumental moment that Jesus is now establishing who he is and why he came. And he's announcing to these disciples, I'm not just anybody. I'm not just a great rabbi. I'm not just a great teacher, but I'm the Son of God. I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then you come to verses 21 and 22. And Jesus announces to these disciples who have left everything to follow him. They've left their homes. They've left their careers. They've left their families. And he says to them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to die. Thank God Jesus set his face like a flint and was headed towards that cross. And the Bible said that at that moment, something happened. Now hear this. Peter, who had just said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, who had been the one who had had that great revelation given to his life. The Bible said that Peter began to rebuke Jesus Christ. He, it's as if he grabs him by the lapels. He pulls him up close. And he said, it's not going to be. It's not going to happen. Now he moves from thou art the Christ to the Son of the living God. And flesh and blood hath not revealed the Son of thee, but my Father. To where now Jesus looks at him. And the Bible said he turns about and he looks at Peter. Can you imagine what that look was like? And the Bible said he rebuked him. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because thou art an offense. Listen, Jesus was not going to be deterred. Jesus was not going to be kept back. Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, was on his way to the cross. And he said these words, listen. He said, if any man will come after me. You know what that is? That's a choice. That's a decision. He, he lays it out. He says, hey, you've got to make a decision. Are you going? Are you going to follow me? Are you going to be a casual believer? Are you just going to go through the motions? Listen, when I looked at Peter there, and the Bible said that Jesus looked at him and said, listen, you desire the praise of men. You, you're more interested in what men think than what God thinks. And the Bible said at that moment that Peter and the rest of those disciples 
We're going to have what was known as a defining moment in your life. You look at Paul walking down the road to Damascus, and he had a defining moment when that great light shined round about him. Moses had a defining moment when God called to him to lead the nation of Israel. David had a defining moment when he stood before Goliath. And when God called to him, there's a defining moment for Nehemiah when he went back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. I'm telling you, every life has a defining moment. And here tonight, he said, if any man will come after me, it's the call of God. You say, how does that call start? That call starts when you get saved. If you're saved, there is the call of God on your life. I, uh, I was 13 years old. And uh, I got to tell you, when I was 13 years old, I had what is known as A D D D D D D D. I still have a mild case. Can I get it in a minute? I steal it. And uh, I, I had ADD. And listen, back then, my parents did not treat ADDD with drugs. They treated it with a belt. Can I get a witness in the house right here? How many of you growing up got weapons? Let me see your hands. Come on. How many have we got? Them? And you're better for it. Amen? Listen, but, but parents say stupid stuff before they whip you. Have you ever noticed this, kids? They do. They say crazy stuff like, like say, this whipping's going to hurt me more than it hurts who? You. How many you know that's the big parental lie? How many you know? Let me see your hand. And then I love this one. I'm going give to give you this whipping, but the reason I'm giving you this whipping is because I love you. And I'm like, hey, Dad, I love you. Lay on the bed and let me beat you for a while. All right, let's share this. And so I passed that love. I love you. Lay down. Hey, listen, I was 13 years old. We were in the city championship in Grand Prairie. We had to win two more games. We were going to go, and we are going to be the city champions in Grand Prairie. And they were getting the forms, and they were getting all the commitments to go to camp. And on the way out that morning, Dr. Oldham said, Now, listen, all you kids, you've got to get your camp forms in today. If you don't get your camp form in today, we're not going to have enough transportation. So, so this is your deadline. You've got to get the camp form in tonight. And pulling out of the parking lot, my dad, who is a retired United States postal worker, can I just tell you, Postal workers are dangerous people. Can I do that? Amen. They are. You know what a flag at half mast at the post office means? It means they are hiring. That's how that works, all right? And my dad was one of those guys. He said, what, where is your camp for? And I said, well, Dad, I, I wasn't planning on going to camp. We've got to win these two games. We're going to be the city champions. My dad is driving. I'm the youngest of three. I'm in the back seat in the middle on the hump. How many you remember the hump? Come on. Amen. And uh, my dad begins to laugh. My dad said, oh, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're not going to do that. Listen, my parents never allowed me to have any decisions in all my life. I want to tell you, I've told you, I love Mexican food. Amen. That's what we're eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. That's what we're going to have. But my dad, when we go to El Chico, let me tell you something. If corny dogs were down for $2.99, you was eating a corny dog. That's how this worked, all right? And uh, my dad starts laughing. And my dad says, I got news for you, pal. You're going to camp. And he said, if you think I'm going to get out of a week without you, you guess again, you are going to camp. We loaded up on a bus the next Sunday night. We were going to Sedalia, Colorado, Silver State Youth Camp. I got to tell you something, friend. It was supposed to be 18 hours, but everybody knows an 18-hour trip on a church bus means 39 hours. Do I have a witness in the house? And, and, I mean, we got up there. There was a guy there by the name of K.P. Smith. This is how we were introduced to camp. He got us in line when we got off the bus. And he make it, made us take a shot for Rocky Mountain Fever. How many of you know if they're telling Clark needles are involved? Clark ain't going to camp. I don't care what Dad says. Amen. We line up. He has been telling us when to get up. He's been telling us when to go to bed. We were at a camp where he made us in the afternoon go and take a nap. I've never taken a nap in my life. And here we are having to take naps. We get to Wednesday night. I've had enough of K.P. Smith. That morning at breakfast. Instead of giving us pancakes and bacon and eggs or something good, he announces to us, we're up in the cool mountain air. He said, we're up in this altitude. And I didn't even know what he was talking about at the time. He said, so most of you are not regular. How many know I just didn't know what that meant, all right? And he began to say, so this morning for breakfast, you're going to eat two prunes. How many of us know that would be child abuse today? Come on, how many know that? And so I, I got my prunes. I said, hey, I'm not eating these prunes. I took those prunes. I put them in a the milk carton. I walked over. I was going to throw them away. K.P. Smith saw me put them in the milk carton. He saw me throwing them away, and he made me dig them out and eat them anyway. I sent a card home to my brother. I said, Mike, you've got to get me out of here. Get me out of here. 
Well, it's Wednesday night. Service is about to start. We sung. And they announced we're going to sing one more song. And they announced that K.P. Smith, the midget dictator of the Silver State Youth Camp, was going to preach. And I said, I'm not doing this. I'm down, uh, uh, down front. And I hear he's going to preach, and I get up and move back here where you heathens are sitting. That's, that's what I get up and move back here, all right? Amen. And I move to the back row, and I, and I mean, I'm back there playing games. They, they've got one of these up there where it says, this doing remembers to me. You know that this doing remembers to me has 23 letters, or 23, tw and you know you cannot divide 23. It won't be divided by 2, 3, 4, any, it's an indivisible number. How do you know that? Because I stood there and watched it that night. That's how I know. I counted the lights. I was playing games. They got to the last part, and KP said, I've got one more illustration for you. And I thought, praise God, I'm going to go get me a knee-high red soda water. Amen, that's what I'm going to do. But for the first time, I look up from that service. Now, you're not going to think this is very spiritual. And it wasn't. But God uses astounding things. Everybody know that? Amen. Amen. I look up there, and KP Smith is walking all over the auditorium, and he's yelling up and down those aisles. And I start thinking to myself, what is he doing? What is he doing? And his index finger was cut off. Can I say his index finger was cut off? So he was pointing with the other finger. How many you know Clark is like, what is going down in church tonight? Amen. I mean, what is it? I'm thinking, can you do this in church now that I'm a pastor? I really want to know. I really want to know. And I got to watch him. Everywhere he went, I followed him all over the auditorium. He's walking back and forth. And, and I'm thinking, for crying out loud, what's he doing? And finally, he says, there's somebody here. He said, and you need to be saved. He said, you know how to go to church, but you're not saved. They sung that night, Brother Leon, for probably 45 minutes. And I stood there on the back row like all good Baptists hanging on for dear life. And after 45 minutes, all those kids were gone. I thought, finally, we're going to get out of here. And KP said, there's somebody here. He said, God won't take you off my heart. You don't like me? I thought, my mom told him, you know something back here. You know something. <laughs> he said, but we're going to sing one more song or one more verse of this song. It's just for you. I'll tell you something. If you'd emptied out the building, I was, I was the only one there. I know who he's talking to. He's talking to me. Started that verse, got down to the chorus, got down to the last part of that chorus, and I let go and started down that aisle. And let me tell you, what I thought was going to be the longest and worst walk of my life turned out to be the shortest and best walk I'd ever made. KP was a little bitty. When I got down there, he said, he put his hands on my shoulders. I mean, he's a little bitty. He said, hey, buddy. He said, I've been praying for you. I said, I know. I wish you'd stop. You're getting on my nerves, man. I'm just telling you, you're getting on my nerves. I didn't say that. I made that up. I didn't say that. He said, you need to be saved. I got saved. I went back to school, and teachers who had read my previous reports from the years before, after about six weeks, said, hey, you don't act like that report. Something happened to you. What happened to you? I said, man, you're not going to believe this, but I said, I went to camp this summer, and on Wednesday morning, they made me eat prunes, and they will change your life. I'm telling you, they'll change your life. I didn't say that neither. I'm lying. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said I went to camp this summer, and I got saved. Teachers would say, saved? What's that mean? I said, I don't know. I can't show you in the Bible where it's at, but I know when I got on that bus and started heading home, the Clark Bozier was a brand new guy. You know what I know? I know the Bible said God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. And you know what he says previous to that? He's not willing that any should perish. But you know what I know about those who are perishing? Everybody ought to get the chance to hear the gospel. Everybody ought to get the chance to know at least one time that they're a sinner, that Jesus saves, and have the, have the awesome privilege of at least one time being in a service or being with a witness who tells them they can be saved. You think about it, how many times, how many times have we heard the gospel? I've heard it hundreds of times. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, growing up, we didn't vote on whether we was going to church. We loaded up and went to church. And there was never debate what we were going to do. We didn't play ball games. I, I got a church now full of people think their kid's going to play in Major League Baseball. The kid can't walk and chew gum. Get him to church, all right? 
to go to church and hear the gospel over and over and over and over again. You know what I think? I think everybody ought to at least get to hear the gospel one time and make a decision about what they're going to do with Jesus Christ. He said, if any man will come after me, he said, let him deny himself. You know what that means? That means at some point in life, you've got to choose. You're going to go God's way or you're going to go yours. Because it's not going to make sense. To, to give to missions doesn't make sense. The natural man, it doesn't make sense. And the flesh man, it doesn't make sense to invest in somebody you don't even know. But you know what I know? I know one day thousands times ten thousands times thousands of thousands are going to gather around the throne of God and we don't know any of them but God help us while, the, while we have time we ought to be investing our time and our talents and our energies into giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ there's some men in here if you just would who knows what you could do who, who knows the preacher you could be who knows the influence you could be on these kids who, who knows what, how God could use your life I heard Josh McDowell the other day say something Kyle that I'll never get over I, I, I've done 284 camps and I love to do camps. I got saved at camp. And by the way, you know if you're an evangelist and you go to camp, you're going to starve to death. Come on, that's the way that works. You give a youth director a checkbook, you're going to get $12. That's how that works. And, uh, but I do all these camps. You know why I do them? Because I got saved at camp. And Josh McDowell said when he turned 40 that he thought, well, my camp days are done. But he said, then it dawned on me, I'm living among a generation of kids who've never had a dad. He said, I was like a dad figure to him. And he said, hey, I'm 70 now. And he said, I thought for sure I'm done. But he said, at 70, I dawned on me, these kids that don't have dads, don't have grandpas. Guys, you, you do not know the influence you men have in this room. You do, you do not know how, how young men just yearn to be near you and yearn to be around you. And they would love to see somebody who's in love with Jesus and, and take them on that journey with them. You say, oh, I can't, I can't go around the world. I can't go do what Brother Noble does. Oh, friend, let me tell you, there's some little boy that who knows, he may be the greatest preacher this world's ever known, and he may be in a Sunday school class somewhere waiting on you. He, he may be in an apartment somewhere waiting on some man to come pick him up in a bus. I'll tell you something, the Trinity Baptist Temple will only be as strong as the godly men who are in this church. And I told you last night, I said, I'm not opposed to women. I'm married to one. Here's my wife right here. Say hi, honey. Amen. She got, she, she's good looking. Come on, everybody say amen. <laughs> I met her at a revival and she started stalking me. How many know that's wrong? Let me, how many know that? <laughs> We'd go to the movies or something. And I'd say, what do you want? She'd say, oh, I'll just drink from the same straw you're drinking from. <laughs> I'd say, do you want some popcorn? No, I'll just lick your fingers. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. I told her when we got married, I said, honey, my mama used to cook me a hot breakfast. The day after we got married, she looked at me and said, if you want a hot breakfast, you're going to need to put your Fruit Loops in the microwave. That's how this goes, all right? She changed, man. They changed, don't they? Come on. You're the man. You got a beard. Say amen. All right, yeah. But I want to tell you something, guys. If, if the men will do what's right, if the men will get the kids and the family to church, do you know that if a, if a child gets saved, 27% of those in the family will be saved after him? You know, if a lady gets saved, the mother, 44% of the family will get saved. But if a man will get saved and start following Jesus, 97% of the family will come to faith in Jesus Christ. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. You know what that means? That doesn't mean you put a cross on your mirror or a cross on your chest, you know what it means? It means literally that you get up on that cross. You know what happens when you get on a cross? You die. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Missions, the gospel, the ministry doesn't make sense if you don't die daily. If you don't say, God, it's not my will, but thy will be done. There's the call. There's the condition you have to die. You have to say that's it. Listen, the Bible said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But it says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. Verse 20 says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
You want to know what you love? You spend time with it. You, know what, you want to know what you love? You invest your money in it. Don't tell me you're in love with Jesus and you're concerned about the gospel if you don't spend time giving the gospel, if you don't spend your, 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 your money, you don't invest your finances to give the gospel. There's the call of God. There's the conditions. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, you know what that phrase, follow me, means? It means you get on Matthew chapter 7 and there's a broad road and that broad road leads you to a narrow path and that narrow path leads you to righteousness. You get on a broad road, you know when you get on it, it's going to be destruction. If you get on a narrow road, you know that narrow road is going to lead to righteousness. You see, there's the call. Hey, there's the commands. But then there's the consequences. Did you hear that? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And then he says, for what is a man profited? If he should gain the whole world, well, what if he gets it all? And he loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I, uh, I went with my wife. She was going to the doctor. Going to the doctor with my wife makes me nervous because I'm the only man in the waiting room. Can I get a witness on this? And it may be freaky, but I'm thinking everybody that walks in there, I've got to explain to them, I'm not here to see the doctor, all right? That's what I have to say. I'm not here to see the doctor. My wife's back there. I'm not, I'm not here to see the doctor. My wife's back there. I, I told all of them. But I, but I finally picked up a magazine, a magazine, an Us magazine that I probably would have never looked at in all my life. But I picked it up, and I began to read a story about a girl in Iran. Listen, since 1979, and Carter was the president, and they locked up those over 400 hostages, I've had a heartburn about Iran. Can I just give you that? I just say it. And I think, you know, Ahmadinejad there, uh, so-called president who just got replaced is a midget dictator and he's just trying to threaten everybody with nuclear and I, I just don't like Iran but I'm reading this article and in this article they begin to tell the story of how they were having what was known as the Iranian revolt you remember the Iranian revolt say amen you remember it and they said they shut down the internet they shut down all communication they shut down cell phone towers but these kids were rising up in Tehran, the, which is the capital city. And there was a little girl that was really not a part of the uprising. There, there were thousands in, in this square. And while they were in this square, this girl pulled up and the traffic was so bad, she didn't know what was going on, but she stood up on her car and she began to look to see what was going on. At that time, kids began to race by her. And while she was up on that car looking to see what was going on, those Iranian soldiers started shooting at those fleeing students. She stood up. And she got hit by a bullet. She's laying in the street. People are running by her, but somebody took out a cell phone and put it over this little girl. She wasn't cussing Iran. She wasn't talking about Ahmadinejad. She was dying, and they filmed her. You know what was amazing about it? She had a cross on. While she was laying there dying in a pool of her own blood, she was screaming, oh, God. Oh, God, oh, God, please, oh, God. Please, please help me. Oh, God, I'm dying. Please help me. And on that cell phone, that article said she passed away. I went back. They hadn't taken it down at this time. And I got some of the younger guys on my staff. I said, you, you find that video. I want to see that video. And I watched that little girl lying there in a pool of her own blood. Didn't matter what her education was, Brother Jack. Didn't matter if she's married or not. Didn't, didn't matter where she lived. Didn't matter how nice or how beat up her car was. It didn't matter. When she was dying, you know what she was crying out for? She was crying out for the help of God. What, what a sad day. That in America, we have a democracy that's gone to a republic that is now fading. That we as a bunch of self-centered Americans couldn't skip a meal or go on a fast or save up some money to send the gospel to some missionary somewhere around the world to tell little girls and little boys just like that about Jesus Christ. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Would you bow your heads for just a moment? And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, come on, who tonight can raise your hand up in full assurance and say, Clark, I know I'm that raise up high. Come on, raise them up. I know I'm saved. Put them right back down. God bless you if you could raise your hand. God bless you if you were honest enough not to raise your hand. I, I wonder how many of you that just raised your hands and said, I'm a believer. I know Jesus. I'm a Christian. I wonder how many of you would say, Clark, I'm saved. Or, Clark, I, I've got some issues in my own life. You talked about getting up on a cross and all. I'm a long ways away from that. I, if ever there was a time in my own life I needed personal revival, that time is now. Come on, you can cover and you can hide it, but come on, let's be honest tonight. How many of us have just raised our hands and say, hey, I'm saved, but I'm not where I need to be spiritually. Just raise your hands way up high. Come on, raise them up all over this building. God bless you. Let me ask you this. How many of you tonight would say, Clark, I'm saved? And Clark, I know I'm saved. But there's somebody I know and love that's lost. They work with you. They go to school with you. They're in their neighbor, your neighborhood. They're, they're in your family. Come on, let's be honest. Raise your hands way up high. I'm burdened for somebody who's lost. Put them right back down. You see our theme verse. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses, witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. You see, real mission starts at home. It starts with your neighbor. It starts with that kid you go to school with. It, it starts with your own family. Listen, it, it, if you were at home lost tonight, you'd want somebody to come pray for you. If you're, you were at home lost tonight, you'd want somebody to be a witness to you. I, I want to ask you this. I wonder how many of you would say, Clark, I'm saved and I know I'm saved. But Clark, I, I, I want to stand before God one day, and I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Listen, it might be that tonight God's telling you to invest in missions like you've never invested in your life. Now, you know what? I, I thought to myself the other day, I've never, I don't know that I've ever sacrificed in all my life. I don't know that I've ever missed a meal. I don't know that I've ever not had a drink of water or clothes. I don't know that I've ever sacrificed in my life. Can you imagine what would happen if we would just say, God, I'm going to make a little sacrifice for the gospel. I'm going to make a little sacrifice for the cause of Christ around the world. Come on, let's be honest. How many of you tonight would say, Clark, I, I want to be that somebody. I want to get on my cross, and I want to follow him, and I want to be an investor for eternity. Come on, how many of you just say, God's moving in my heart right now concerning missions. And, and Clark, I want you to pray with me about what my investment will be in this missions program. Come on, let me see your hands. Raise them up all over this building. Raise them up. I want to see them all over this building. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. When I get done praying, our brothers are going to start singing as soon as I say amen. In all of this building, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and come to an altar and tonight do business with God. Christians, I'm going to ask you tonight to lead the way. This is an invitation to those who are saved and God's calling you to, to a, a deeper walk. God's calling you to revival in your own heart. God's calling you to reach your own family and friends. And God's calling you to be a, an, an ambassador that goes and invests their time and invests their finances to give the gospel around the world. But I want to ask you this before we pray and come. I wonder if there's not somebody in this room that would say, Clark, if I died tonight. And by the way, you don't know that you won't die tonight. You don't know. You read the obituary today, there was somebody alive yesterday who thought they'd be alive, but they're gone. Since we started this service, some seven to 8,000 people have died. Oh, half of which, 3,500 or 4,000 of which died what is known as an unexpected death. Listen, you're going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. The word appointed means set, fixed, and movable. You're going to die. Let me ask you this question. I wonder who in this building wouldn't raise your hand up and say, Clark, if I died tonight, I, I'm not positive. I'm not sure that heaven would be my eternal home. I don't know that I know Jesus, but, but I'm concerned enough about my eternity. Pray for me. Come on, right now, just raise your hand up if that's you. Come on, raise your hand up and be honest with yourself. And honest with God and honest with eternity. Clark, I'm not ready to die. I don't know that I'm saved. Come on, raise your hands way up high. Be honest. Be honest. You see, two minutes after you die, it'll be two minutes too late to do anything about it. Come on. Right now, join these. Raise your hands way up high. Join them. Amen. 
Listen, Brother Kyle is going to be right down front. If you're not sure of your salvation, you come and take him by the hand and say, I want to be saved. Christians tonight, lead the way. Our Father, we love you and praise you and we ask tonight that God the Holy Spirit would walk up and down these aisles and that he'd do his work, that he'd move and prod and convict. And I pray God tonight for that somebody who needs revival that they might find it here tonight. I pray God tonight for that somebody who said, I've got family and friends that are lost. That's somebody who said, man, I, I want my time and talent to be invested for eternity. God, I pray tonight all over this building, Christians will come and fall on these altars and tonight seek your face. God, tonight that's somebody who's in this room that's not saved. Let them come tonight. Let them be saved. And God, we're going to thank you for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stay. Come on, right now. Come on, right now. You need to be saved. You come to Brother Kyle. The rest of you, come on, right now. Take up your cross. Follow him. Amen. How about you? Come on, right now. Amen.
Well, praise the Lord, man. Praise God for his goodness, amen. We uh, are challenged again tonight. I pray that uh, your heart again was stirred. Every uh, true and lasting work always comes with sacrifice, and um, the Lord showed that demonstrated by his sacrifice on the cross, and um, we have a, a sacrifice the moment we give our life to him, and uh, it's a perpetual, it's a continual, as, as he shared Paul said, I die daily. He said he fought with the beasts at Ephesus, and uh, there, was, there was things that Paul went through for the sake of the gospel. And uh, he was w- putting his life on the line on a daily basis. And I just, I pray that heart would be in all of us. Uh, because as Brother Clark shared, there's one soul that we, we may know right now in our life that needs us to get out of that selfish condition and just say, okay, Lord, use me. And it may come by way of supporting a missionary. It may come by way of um, us sending somebody. It may come by way of our own mouth and faithfulness. But we've got to be willing to say, here I am, Lord. I'm laying myself on on the altar of sacrifice for you. And so I pray that, again, you would uh, keep this turning over in your heart, keep it turning over and and cultivating and and letting God work in your heart as as he shared. Uh, I hope that you're challenged. Give more, do more, um, go more, and uh, just see what God would do when we're willing to lay down ourselves and uh, sacrifice for him, for his cause. And so, again, I appreciate that, Brother Clark, and I pray that you'll go by tonight and be a blessing to our missionaries. Uh, I'm going to ask them to go over there uh, to their tables. I want to remind you about tomorrow night. I'm going to announce what our mission trip is, and as Brother Clark said, uh, it, you got to get involved. And earlier, as Brother Noble said, uh, he didn't want to go. He, he came up with every excuse why he couldn't go. And uh, God touched his heart. There's story after story like that. Um, if we're just willing to say, okay, God, show me what you want. And so we're going to talk about that tomorrow night, also about faith promise. So however it is that God's leading your heart, we're asking you to, to let the Spirit lead you, uh, what you're going to give to missions this coming year and, and promise. And I want to share that just real quick before we dismiss uh, some people don't quite understand faith promise. This is a way for us to know exactly what we can count on based on your promises, your, your promise of giving to missions, what we can do throughout the year. Uh, as I shared, the numbers didn't match what was promised last year. And so we, we want to not just be kind of shooting in the dark and, and doing like that. We want to know what we can do and then step out on faith if, if God leads us to do more uh, than do that. So we want to encourage you not, if you say, you know, I've been giving to missions to this church for X amount of years. We still want you to fill out a card every year. We still want you to do that and participate. Uh, That way we can know what we're doing. Um, And so I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, one last thing. We're going to have communion Sunday night. And I pray that you're going to be here. Um, I'm going to be sharing some scripture and sharing some things. And uh, I pray that, man, God will just continue uh, to to nail our hearts and um, get us right where he wants us. Uh, Because I think that we can see God do some amazing things. We're seeing him do some amazing things. Uh, if we'll just, again, just yield to him. And so uh, communion, great time to remember that sacrifice I was talking about. So, again, I thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, supporting uh, our missions and uh, supporting this church. Brother Clark, thank you so much and your family and friends for coming. And uh, we uh, are blessed by you guys. So, you guys, go by and be a blessing to our missionaries. And I hope that you all have a great evening. And we'll uh, pray and dismiss. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much, Lord, for this uh, time again. God, I I just want to say that, um, Lord, I I want you to have all of me. Lord, use me up, God, that my daily prayer. Use me up whatever way you you see fit. Lord, I lay my my life, my family on on your altar. And and I just want you to to take us, take me, and, and do as you please, God. I want your kingdom to be exalted. I want your name to be exalted. And I, I just, I want your, your kingdom to be built, uh, Lord, and, and use us however, however you, you see fit. God, I pray that would be every single one of our prayers. God, that we would just simply submit our lives to you every day. Lord, there's nothing to hang on to in this world that's worthwhile. It's temporal, Lord. You tell us that in your word. The things that we can't see are eternal, and I pray And, God, we would give ourselves over to that. Lord, I just ask that you would help us as we go home tonight, again, to continually cultivate this message, cultivate what you're doing in our hearts. And, 
Uh, Lord, we'll be sure to praise you for all that you do. Again, we thank you for this time, and we ask and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.